Good afternoon, colleagues, and welcome to today's IPPN Knowledge Cafe on addressing resilience deficits across the SDGs through a systems approach with particular practical insights from India and Yemen. So my name is Laurel Hansen, and I am a disaster risk reduction expert with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and I will be moderating today's session on behalf of IPPN. The etiquette for today's session will be posted in the chat, but at a top level, I hope you can help me ensure a smooth session by keeping your microphone muted and putting any questions that you may have for the speakers into the chat as we continue the session. They'll answer them following their presentations and today's event will be recorded and posted online. With that, let's begin to dive into the work of the IPPN and the focus of today's session. For those of you who are unfamiliar, the IPPN, or Integrated Policy Practitioners Network, is a network that aims to link existing efforts on SDG integration across UN agencies and beyond. It is open to policy practitioners in the UN system, as well as in government, civil society, academia, and the private sector. IPPN is a joint effort under the umbrella of the former UN SDG Task Team on Integrated Policy Support. Launched in November 2021, it is currently co-led by nine UN agencies. So knowledge cafes such as the one we are holding today help us as a network focus in on how to identify, understand, and act to address interconnected and interdependent development challenges. Today's discussion builds on a knowledge cafe that was held this past February, which concentrated on the UN common guidance on helping build resilient societies. During that session, in addition to presenting the guidance itself, participants shared examples of how the approach is being implemented by UN partners at the global, regional, and country levels. If you're interested, you can find a recording of that session online. But today we'll focus on tools for strategic foresight and planning coming from the UN Global Assessment Report on Disaster Risk Reduction Special Report 2023, Mapping Resilience for the Sustainable Development Goals. Using new analysis and hazard mapping, the report explores what risk-informed sustainable development looks like in our increasingly complex and interconnected risk landscape. It highlights how risks are systemic and interconnected and how pitfalls can be transformed into opportunities to build resilience. Understanding the risks stemming from interdependencies between systems and sectors is key to reorienting our work towards risk-informed development. Today's session aims at raising awareness and building the knowledge base on resilience deficits and opportunities to address them. This is imperative as systemic problems require systemic solutions implemented through joint and integrated efforts. With that, I'm excited to introduce today's three speakers before giving the floor to the first. So first we'll hear from Ms. Genty Kirschwood, who's the head of global risk analysis and reporting at the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, also known as UNDRR. Genty will be giving us an overview of the 2023 GAR special report, the resilience deficits it highlights and the key lessons learned. Next, we will hear from Mr. Aromar Revi, who's the director of the Indian Institute for Human Settlements. And he will take us through a case study focused on India, examining the interlinkages between climate change, heat, systemic risk, and the SDGs. Our final speaker today will be Tafik Saeed, who's the team leader, peace operations support ad interim at the UN Development Program, or UNDP, in Yemen. Tafik will speak to us on the Yemen case study focused on solutions to alleviating water stress and the importance of the water sector as an entry point highly interconnected with other sectors. Again, throughout the session, I'd love to encourage you to write questions as they occur to you using the chat function. And we hope to make this session as interactive as possible following the presentations from the speakers. With that, I'd like to give the floor to Ms. Kirschwood, who will take us through the 2023 GAR special report. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for that introduction, Laurel, and it's really a pleasure to be here with everyone this afternoon. And I hope that you'll take the time to explore the report yourself a little bit in detail, um, because I think it really hits on a critical issue that really stretches across the UN system about how do we build better resilience to global risks in an increasingly complex and uh, volatile and intense climate environment. First slide, please. I perhaps skip to the second one. So the special report came out earlier this year, uh, and it focuses on this idea of mapping resilience to the sustainable development goals. First slide, please. And it focuses on this idea 
that we can build resilience to poly crisis. But in order to do that, we really need to understand those crises better, and particularly to understand the relationship between people, planet, and prosperity in a systemic and integrated way. Because it's clear that risk drivers like climate change are increasing the strength and uh, intensity and frequency of hazard events, but also that when those hazards combine with hazard other risks, such as conflict, epidemics, and inflation, they can really cause compounding poly crisis. And those cascading effects have long-term impacts on our ability to achieve the sustainable development goals. The report was developed really as a cooperative um, a cooperative uh, arrangement across UN partners and experts. It's a really positive example where we have UN organizations working together who are experts in particular areas of SDG achievement. And they've been working with modeling experts to basically use that better data more effectively to look at climate and other impacts, both now and in a climate future towards 2050. At the same time, while the trends that are outlined in the maps are highly concerning, and we can see that if we continue business as usual, we face some incredible de resilience deficits moving forward and some challenges in being able to really achieve the SDGs. For each of the maps, we also have a complementary case study. We have people who will speak to those later today. And those case studies really show that action is possible around the globe. Countries are working to really better build resilience to shocks and to build the ability to more clearly create the sustainable future that we all need. So first slide. I do encourage you to take a look at the report. There's roughly a dozen maps. They focus on a number of different issues and they're all drawn in four SDG data. So data from across your organizations, data that you were, your teams have been collecting with governments around the world. And we've been combining, for example, the best available data on drought risk with SDG data from FAO about food insecurity. And you can see in this map, as we look forward, there's a concerning trend where we see increasing areas of drought risk correlating or at least connecting to areas um, of potential uh, current food insecurity. And of course, there is a key resilience deficit if we see increasing insecurity connected with increasing drought risk. Next slide. And yet at the same time, it's not always a direct hazard driven effect. What we also see is as we look at cascading and compounding risk that you have factors like forced displacement, which is a secondary effect of, of uh, both hazard risk, but also conflict and other types of development risk, combining with negative education outcomes. This is a real concern because if we're going to take a holistic approach to achieving the SDGs, it's essential that we're able to make sure that that next generation is able to access basic educational services and, and, uh, and to be able to build the human capital for our next generations. Next slide. And of course, another key area that the report looks at is water stress and population growth. As you can see in this map, we're looking at areas where there's currently high levels of water stress and looking also at areas where we see perhaps more people needing to rely on those on those resources moving forward to in a climate future to 2050. These, these maps are important, not because they pretend to predict the future, but they do show areas of resilience deficit now, and they should hopefully help us think about more integrated solutions about how we can better understand these risks, and we can work with communities, with government and other stakeholders to have better strategies to ensure sustainable development. And indeed, the case study um, that related to this map in the report focuses on Yemen, and you'll see more details on that in the coming few in the coming presentations from other speakers. And the last resilience deficit that I wanted to highlight, which is also related to uh, the case study of India, next slide, focuses on this issue about factors such as heat stress, and not only the compounding and cascading impacts of these effects, but also some of the trade-offs or some of the connections between, for example, adaptation and mitigation action that will be needed. This map looks at the issue of where areas in the world will be experiencing most likely higher levels of heat stress, and then also ensuring sustainable development in those areas is going to require increasing access to energy, but at the same time, potentially increasing access to air conditioning to be able to, to 
if you like, underpin some of that economic growth that is essential for sustainable development. But at the same time, we see that there are actions around the world, and India is a good example, where there are consultative processes moving forward to look with communities about how to better handle issues like heat stress and to put in place more sustainable systems. Next slide. So those are not all of the maps, but it gives you, I hope, a little bit of a taste of the interagency work that went into producing this analysis. And I hope that you'll take, take some time to explore further some of the work in the actual report. But in terms of conclusions, I think many of them will be underpinning some of the key messages of, of uh, GAR more broadly, but essentially the need for urgent and effective climate change action to reduce greenhouse gases, but also to group build resilience to shocks, the need to recognize that building resilience is possible and that by building resilience, you can actually accelerate achievement of the sustainable development goals and the sustainable development targets. It's not an add-on, it's not an additional expense, it's a prerequisite to effective sustainable development to have resilience preventative action in place. Another key conclusion of this is that the SDD framework is not only a set of development goals, it's really a set of targets that we can utilize as a tool to quantify where some of those resilience are, resilience deficits are, and to see how effective some of our accelerator actions can be to build sustainable resilient development pathways despite our complex climate future. And at the same time, the report outlines that existing data is really useful in helping um, improve our analytical capacity. We don't necessarily need to focus on, there's not necessarily such a data deficit, but there is data available in many of our agencies that can be better understood, better analyzed, better interpreted. Again, not to predict the future in a binary way, but to be able to help us look at possible solutions, pathways and challenges moving forward. And my last slide. So a couple more points I think relevant for this group are improving the accessibility and quality of that hazard and SDG data is important. I think many of us are now work are engaged in connecting with governments, with national statistical societies, with other stakeholders. And it's important that we be harnessing that data and using it in responsible and effective ways. The SDG indicators are an incredibly useful tool for identifying resilience deficits and in helping set some of the metrics and processes to keep us on track to achieving the SDGs. But investing in early adaptation and resilience building is essential and it will avoid costs in terms of lives, in terms of money, and it will also help us have a more sustainable and, and less volatile future. And But in doing this also, it's utterly critical that we look across people, planet and prosperity. Having a siloed strategy that only focuses on economic growth without looking at environmental impacts or only looks at social indices without looking at the environment and uh, wider context is not effective in our very interconnected and systemic world. And so as we move forward, it's important that the frameworks that we put in place for looking at sustainable development in the future and looking at the impact of development for future generations look across those elements of people, planet, and prosperity, not only focusing on a narrow conception of economic growth. So that I hope that gives you a snapshot. Last slide. For those of you who may not have had a chance, here is the QR code to download the full report. It's, it's about 50, 70 pages, including the annexes, largely visual, but it includes, I think, a little bit more in some of this background, and I hope you'll take a chance to uh, explore it a bit further. We're very happy to hear your feedback. My email is there or other colleagues from uh, UNDRL. We'd love to hear your thoughts, suggestions, and feedback. Thank you very much. Back over to you, Laura. Thank you so much, Genty, for your presentation. And I really like the hopeful tone that you took that building resilience is possible and it is a prerequisite for us to achieve sustainable development. I'd like to now hand over the floor to Mr. Aramar Rebi, who's the director of the Indian Institute for Human Settlements. Aramar, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you, Laurel. I'll try and build on where Genty left off and the work that we've done uh, in GAR 23 in the last 15 years at, at UNDRR to try and bring these ideas together. Plus, of course, because I've been involved in the climate process for a long time, 
I'll try and build on the work that we've done uh, within the IPCC on what can be called climate and disasters in development. And I think that's the core idea in some sense is how can we bring together sustainable development or particularly the SDGs along with adaptation, mitigation, disaster risk reduction. And now that we have it, uh, the Convention on Biodiversity, you know, they're, they're all tied together. And I guess heat is a really good and interesting way of trying to explore this. Uh, the interesting thing about India in particular, and I'll use that as a case to explain the larger condition, is that for a decade or so now, um, we first started in India with the first um, you know, heat action plan uh, in, uh, in Ahmedabad, one of the cities in, in Western India. And now pretty much 16 of India's 30 odd states have heat action plans. There are about 100 odd, but I'm gonna be speaking from an assessment that's still ongoing for about you know, 40 odd heat action plans. So why is this kind of sort of important? It's important because historically, of course, we know that the planet is warming. We're at 1.1 degrees above the pre-industrial average. Uh, but the, the question for us is that in many parts of the world, especially in the tropics, we are well above 1.5 degrees in local conditions because cities, for example, have urban heat island effects. The city of Kolkata, as we recorded in the IPCC, already is well above you know, 2.6 degrees as a recent piece of work on the city of Mumbai, and that's true of many others in Latin America and Africa, et cetera, where you find mean elevations in the cities well, you know, maybe five or six or seven degrees higher than the surrounding countryside. So how does it play itself out? It plays itself out, obviously, in terms of outdoor heat. That's what we're kind of aware of. That's what the science measures in some senses. But when you're looking at the operationalization of this, and this is where it connects with interventions and trying to deal with this question that's there, you're really talking about what's happening inside, inside built environments. And if you're living in an informal settlement, if you're a woman who is sort of actively involved in the supply chain, producing, let's say, piecework in textiles, as you'll see in many parts of, let's say, Bangladesh, India, parts of the Philippines, and some parts of Africa, you have a very challenging situation because you're in a place that is inadequately ventilated, not properly cooled, the outside temperatures may be very high, and you're in locations with high humidity. So when the wet bulb temperature actually reaches a particular threshold, it becomes, forget about working, it becomes almost impossible to be able to function as a human being. And that's a challenge that we're going to be facing increasingly. And this is now coming to us in you know multiple heat waves. Uh, Northern India has seen this uh, over this this uh, you know the last year or so, and we're seeing this happening in many other parts of the world, right? So where does it connect up with a rather risk framework? It connects up because it's not only a question of particular heat waves or events. It is sequences of you know many many nights of of of, of warm weather in some senses, uh, and it translates out into three or four fairly simple things, which I guess all of us can uh, can. Kind of understand. In the extreme case, especially for both very young and very old people, it leads to death. And we're seeing this now pretty much across the world, depending on you know which newspaper you pick up or what, what media source that you have. It leads to increasing morbidity for particular kind of risk factors. We know what they are, especially you know dealing with cardiovascular disease and a whole range of other conditions. But something that's becoming very, very significant, and I'll give you, you know, a particular number here. The ILO has estimated that if the present heat trends continue for India, uh, India, which is now the largest population in the world, 1.5 billion people, would probably lose about 20, about 5% of the work days that are available for the working population, which is a huge resource. You know, it's about 30, 40 uh, equivalent uh, million jobs uh, a year. And for a country that's not adding on new jobs, you can see what the implication is in terms of its connection with dealing with SG1 around poverty, food security, et cetera. Basically, people who are involved in both outdoor work, which is agricultural workers, people in construction, people in active work that's there, for certain parts of the day and sometimes for many, many days uh, in, in difficult months will find it very difficult to function. Uh, and of course, people who live inside and work inside, uh, including, let's say, children in school, will find it difficult to function. So this is a huge impact, which sort of cascades through uh, the national economy as far as it's concerned. So what do sort of heat action plans try and do? They try and, you know, first try and understand where the problem is, try and isolate which the most vulnerable populations are, and address them through a set of targeted interventions, you know, places that are cooler, uh, you know, making sure that uh, for example, schools and working in particular environments is restricted during certain times of the day or year, and then you know laying out an entire framework by which we can address this. And uh, if you look at look look at the content of these plans, there are about uh, half a dozen different things that, that that are actually happening. There are lots of different options. I guess the good news is 
that because there's so much innovation happening on the ground, we have a whole range of different options. The challenge, of course, is bringing it together into something that can be implemented in a consistent way that's consistent with the larger sort of uh, uh, interests of development. So what, what do you kind of do? The obvious things are you provide infrastructure, you provide rooms that are cooler, you have you know buildings that are, are shelters for people who are especially vulnerable, uh, younger children, older people, et cetera. You also try and look at significant changes in behavior. So for example, you know, there are labor guidelines that do not allow or try and restrict uh, working in particular um, industries that have a lot of heat or actually working out in the open as far as that's concerned, shutting schools at various times, changing the patterns of transportation in some senses. The challenge for us is many of these interventions require energy. And what that means effectively is you may be actually increasing emissions to deal with cooling needs in some senses or extreme conditions, which in some, in some ways is sort of uh, contributing to um, the challenge of, of climate change. So you really want to bring together adaptation and mitigation, which basically means you have to have adaptive potential while simultaneously trying to make sure that you can actually reduce temperatures. And one of the most effective ways of doing that is what we call nature-based solutions. So very simply, the city or the village or the town heats up uh, because it's got a lot of concrete and steel and glass and stuff like that like I said, between two and maybe five degrees more than the surrounding areas. So how do you deal with that? We have very clear evidence that if you have green spaces and if you have uh, a fair amount of water, which we're kind of losing pretty much across our landscapes, because of the evapotranspiration, that can actually balance out the impact of the urban heat island and potentially to some extent, the overall rise in temperatures that come to us because of climate change. So we have to bring together all of these processes, including good information systems for early warning, Nowadays, of course, a lot is being used through social media uh, and dealing with building institutional capacity inside health systems so that health practitioners know that there's going to be a risk, for example, if there are heat waves for particular populations and they have ways of dealing with that. Education, of course, is very critical. Children are at considerable risk in some senses and something that's slowly building, especially in India, uh, it's a little bit slow in this, to look at labor and what kind of work uh, can actually happen in some senses. And then, of course, there's a whole range of things on the tech side dealing with energy efficiency, cooling, et cetera, by building better buildings, by sharing them and doing a whole range of other things. So they are, at least in the Indian context, maybe a hundred different things that can make up a heat action plan. The challenge that we've had, I guess, in the last 10 years is many of these initiatives have been fragmented. They've been bottom up. So there's sort of limited systemic engagement and the connection with the SDGs is fragmented. Um, so there's a, in some ways, I would say a cookie cutter cutter approach that's been used. We have to develop a method of trying to be able to customize these processes to the particular location that you are. If you're on the coast, you'll have very different challenges if you're in an inland area that's exposed to drought in some senses. And the connection between heat stress and other processes, which is what Genti was talking about, this compounding and cascading risk, heat stress can be alleviated if you have enough water. But if you are in a region that's going through a drought, then you have a whole issue in terms of water stress that needs to be dealt with as far as it's concerned. Similarly, uh, you know, how, how would you actually connect this with actually having proper ventilation and cooling in particular places. So you have to change the pattern of building, you have to change your building bylaws, et cetera, as far as it's concerned. And the other thing, which is not so obvious, even the GAR, uh, you know, we haven't been very focused on that. Heat actually touches pretty much all of the SDGs. So heat obviously touches SDG two very clearly because if you can't go out as an agricultural workforce and produce enough food, you have a food security problem. It touches three because health is approximate list more morbidity and more mortality, like I talked about. In many cases, it, it shuts down schools, probably not as much as COVID, but it makes a significant difference. And of course, there is a very strong uh, gender related element because women do a lot of the hard work that is associated with trying to keep families and communities and economic systems actually running. And so they're particularly vulnerable. The challenge that we've had in India with the heat action plans that we've seen develop is apart from being fragmented, they have weak methods of actually trying to target and address vulnerabilities. So the more you're able to unbundle and unpick vulnerabilities and relate them to particular development processes, the easier it is to sort of mount an intervention set that actually works across the system. Because as we know from the climate process, we have to think systemically. If you're only going to go in and deal with one part of the challenge and not look at the systematic underlying drivers, then you're pretty certain going to be overtaken by these challenges because they are systemic challenges in, in some senses. Similarly, obviously, SG6 and water is a very critical question, and SG7 is very important. If you're going to have to cool and you know use a whole lot of air conditioning, 
then you're actually going to be uh, accelerating maladaptive behavior, which is exactly what we don't want to do uh, in when, we, when we're dealing with questions of heat. So in conclusion, this is a systemic challenge. It has many connections to the development process and a whole range of the SDGs. I haven't come to 13 and down, and down, the, down the road as far as that's concerned. It has a connection with a whole range of other processes and other sectors like agriculture, like um, you know, manufacturing uh, and, and services in particular economies. So there's an opportunity then, just like in COVID, for a, for a heat stress to then propagate through the SDG system and create a whole range of challenges that we haven't, um, are not necessarily sort of ready to take on uh, and deal with. So we have good examples, uh, but those examples are not, um, I would say, deep enough. They're not happening quickly enough. Uh, in India, you know, if you have a few hundred cities doing this stuff, it actually doesn't add up to very much because we have 10,000 of them. So the question is, how do you bring this forward and how does one build the connection across different levels of government with other actors, especially civil society um, and, and the private sector to try and make this work? So I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Rebbi. And I, I really like the way you pointed how issues related to heat impact all the SDGs and also the portfolio of solutions needed to address that impact cut across them, including nature-based solutions. And, and with that, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Saeed, who is the team leader for peace operations support at Interim at the UNDP in Yemen. This, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, I'll, my presentation will focus on, uh, will highlight the, the water resource problem in Yemen, while at the same time highlight the importance of initiatives undertaken in Yemen to address this issue. Yemen is one of the most water scarce countries in the world. Yemen is now experiencing its water golden age. For years, Yemen has been living above its water needs and is using its non-renewable water, groundwater at unprecedented and, irre and irreplaceable pace. The lack of political will coupled with the, the fragmentation due to conflict has impeded collective efforts to build a more sustainable system. Uh, the country is rapidly approaching an era when we have only renewable water resources, as uh, such as rain, surface, and shallow groundwater will be the only options available for both human and agricultural uh, use. Yemen is also extremely vulnerable to climate change related impacts such as drought, extreme flooding, cyclones, pests and disease uh, outbreaks and changes of rainfall patterns. Increased system frequency and sea level rise as well as frequent of lo locust invasion. Second slide, please. Second slide, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, according to UNDP produced yeah, according to UNDP produced report, which uh, had the title Water uh, Related Conflict Assessment, it was produced in 2022. Uh, Yemen's uh, water scarcity can be classified into three types. Physical scarcity, where we have insufficient availability in quality or quantity of water uh, resources compared to demand. We have also economic scarcity, where lack of economic technical resources required to successfully adapt to the physical scarcity. And then we have structural scarcity, where lack of social capacity to respond to and change social use and management of water. Uh, given the extreme water scarcity in Yemen, uh, fulfillment of sustainable development goal six will require considerable and tangible efforts at all levels to manage and allocate available water resources. Second slide, please. Um, here we're talking about the trend analysis and view of the physical, economic, as well as structural water scarcity in Yemen demonstrates significant potential of all types of sport of scarcity to worsen uh, without significant intervention. Under climate change, uh, it's possible that the hydrometeorological hazards, primarily drought and flood, will also increase. Considering key drivers of water-related conflicts identified at the local level, it's not clear whether these trends will mean increase in local water uh, in, in local water-related conflict, but it's a real possibility. Now, considering the, conf the conflict is already demonstrated uh, within and between and across communities and across sectors, drinking water versus agricultural water, for example, and urban and rural population, all of which can impact at the local level. Second slide, please. 
UNDP is collaborating with, a, with various UN agencies in the implementation of joint programs, including FAO, WFP, and ILO to support resilient livelihoods, food security, and climate adaptation in Yemen. A specific program worth highlighting is the resilience program in the irrigation and agricultural sector, uh, which is a KFW-funded program implemented by FAO as well as UNDP, and it aims to enhance livelihood resilience uh, and sustainable peace in Yemen through the sust sustainable water management. The project is implemented in three target government rates in the north as well as the south, uh, and it adopts a multi-pronged approach to address uh, the three types of water scarcity, um, which were described previously in the previous slides. To address the physical uh, water scarcity, the project is uh, rehabilitating water infrastructure, such as small dams, rainfall, uh, rainwater tanks, as well as cleaning canals. Uh, for the economic uh, water scarcity, uh, the project uh, is addressing that through uh, the installation of modern irrigation systems and the delivery of water infrastructure equipment and construction materials. For the last type of water scarcity, uh, which is the structural water scarcity, the project has worked with local authorities and communities to establish water user associations and build their institutional, technical, as well as financial capacities to be able to implement interventions and also initiatives at the local level. Second slide, please. Um, within this program, UNDP is implementing activities related to um, addressing the structural uh, uh, scarcity of water, including the implementation of community consultations to identify water infra infrastructure interventions. The, the, the objective is to um, identify such interventions jointly and in a participatory way with the local communities so that we mitigate any uh, conflicts that might arise. Um, water user associations uh, were established and their capacities have been enhanced through dedicated, dedicated trainings and capacity building on effective management of water user associations, water resource management, conflict management, and resolution and community-based early warning system. The capacity building component was also followed by a practical component where water user associations take the initiatives themselves to, tra to translate the learnings that they have taken or, observe, uh, or obtained through the trainings into a real practice that is achieved through the implementation of community mediation initiatives to address small water related conflicts. The capacity building components was not only restricted to the, uh, to the water user associations, but rather in, uh, it, it, it included the local authorities and local institutions and uh, uh, in the target areas. Furthermore, the project has also enhanced dialogue among the main stakeholders, and this has uh, been achieved through the roundtable discussions around conflict uh, solutions. And here, it, it, it was very um, promising in the sense that local communities, as well as authorities and also institutions were all engaged in one place where they talk, discuss, and agree on specific uh, mechanism to address water-related conflicts. Um, last slide, please. Uh, yeah, so that uh, actually was actually my last slide, but uh, the last but not least, it's worth uh, to highlight that water is at the core of sustainable development. Hence, sustainable water resource management is critical for the achievement of other sustainable development goals. The uh, including enhancing agricultural production, food security, alleviating poverty, promoting health and well being of communities, enhancing social cohesion, and promoting peaceful and inclusive resolutions of conflict. This could be achieved through the adoption of integrated water resource management, which is adopted by UNDP as well as other UN agencies working on water uh, resources as well as agriculture. Thank you so much. I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Mr. Saeed. That was a really great intervention that I feel really highlighted the need for joint approaches and a multi-pronged approach. Um, with that, I would like to open the floor to the question and answer. Um, and if you have a question for the participants, I would love it if you can raise your hand and I can call on you. But in the interim, I will read aloud some questions that have been already posted in the chat. So Mr. Ravi, I believe this one is for you. Um, so Madhav Palan has said, interesting to see heat strokes as a human security issue into a health 
issue and then it's focusing on if there should be any standardized solutions so just a first one to kick things off over to you on the need for standardized solutions thank you thanks i mean i think from the biomedical point of view they're fairly clear established limits the challenge is it's experienced rather differently in different contexts either because of age uh, so older people who are exposed to certain sort of medical conditions are much more exposed uh, and also, you know, based on your occupation. So I think one of the, the core questions for us is you don't want to start dealing with people after they've got heat stroke, fine. You want to deal with that before you actually are exposed to this heat stroke to vulnerable populations. And the challenge then in terms of regulation or intervention of public uh, kind of awareness is which are the most vulnerable populations you're dealing with? Like I gave you the example of women work workers in home-based uh, textile work that's there. Uh, we need to identify in our particular localities. And, you know, so obviously if you're sitting in a coastal city where you might be at, you know, 38 degrees, but your wet bulb temperature, because you're at 90% 90 humidity, uh, may mean that you're at extremely high risk compared to somebody who's inland in a dry area. Um, so absolute standards don't make sense. We need to have local processes that are linked to livelihoods and, and vulnerabilities. And, and that's where questions of, of inequality, for example, and this particular case, gender inequality uh, and living conditions become very important. So that ties together SG 11, uh, 5, and maybe um, you know 10 at the same time. Thank you so much, Mr. Ravi. Um, so another question that we've gotten in, this one is for you, Genti. So we know that the GAR special report 2023 pointed to the specific resilience deficits and the options to address them, but where do we go from here? So will future reports address the topic in more detail or is it expected that they will relate more to practical action? Can you give us kind of a, a preview? Great, thank you for that, uh, Laurel. I mean, I think there's a couple of different things. I think what we're saying here partly is we need to get better at measuring what we really value. And of course, Economic prosperity is part of that, but so is social prosperity, and so is our environment and our ability to continue to uh, develop sustainably uh, and also to leave something behind for our future generations. And so I think as we're looking forward within the GAR series, we want to really, first of all, try to better help our UN community because the GARs are our UN products and we're proud to work with UNDP and others on them. Um, but it's really important, and in our next uh, special report in 2024, that we're trying to get better at learning partly from previous major disasters, because it's clear that some of these more extreme events that uh, we had thought of as being one in a hundred year events are becoming more frequent, um, and that we can learn a lot from good disaster forensics about what has happened, for example, recently in Hawaii, what happened in the Pakistan floods, what's been happening with the Canada wildfires. So we need to more syst systematically understand partly what is learned, what we can learn now with good disaster forensics. At the same time, we need to begin to get better at looking forward and looking at where we can move and better understand future impacts. And I think that this is where combining our social knowledge with some of the work coming out from the climate change side is also essential. And then the final part I wanted to raise, and we'll be bringing this up in GAR 2025, is really looking at where the incentives are, where our governance systems, but also our financial systems can evolve to create the right climate for really you know, acting to put the value behind what matters to us across people, planet and prosperity. So watch that space. Uh, and I, I very much look forward to working with uh, many of the colleagues uh, engaged in our UN family to, to bring some of this understanding more deeply into our into our common practice. Thanks. Thank you so much, Genti, for the sneak preview. And I see that Madhavan Palan has his hand up. So Madhavan, I'd love for you to unmute if possible and pose your question directly to the panelists. Everyone, yeah, uh, I was just wondering, you know, uh, have, you, uh, have you asked, you know, the economic perspective, because many countries will, uh, won't be able to have an economic standard for all these DRRs as well as, uh, you know, calamities. So are we, you know, posing that as well? Because, as, uh, and I see that SDG Summit is right around the corner next month, actually. So will we be asking this question so that they are prepared and, you know, they can raise funds for certain, you know, uh, certain of these projects, actually. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Mr. Pollan, for coming in. And Genti, I see you've unmuted yourself, so maybe I'll let you take this one first. No, thank you. If I understand the question, I, I think you're spot on about saying, look, we need to align uh, how we look at our future programming to be in line with where some of these emerging needs are. But I'd love to hear other panelists take on this. Um, and if I understand your, cor your question correctly, yes, it's really important we get the right kinds of metrics in place. And that's some of the experimentation we started with GAR 2023, because if we keep only measuring development success by GDP, we're missing a real strong range of impacts of all of the things that we've talked about today. And if we're really looking at building resilience and even economic resilience, if we don't deal with issues like heat stress as Aramar was raising or, or water security as, uh, as uh, Tariq, uh touched on, we won't continue to gather the kinds of dividends we need to protect future generations and grow sustainability. sustainable. Thanks. Yeah, just to pick up on what Genty said just now, I mean, obviously the economic questions are very real. The challenge is that economics doesn't necessarily uh, capture all of the impact sets we're talking about. Many of these things are hidden. Uh, let's say women's work in some sense is not even valued. Forget about, you know, being valorized in some sense, in, in some ways. So, you know, the number I gave you for India was 5% of, of total employment being impacted by heat waves. Uh, so, you know, it's a large population, 650 million people, 5% of that is a lot. We're a $3 billion, um, uh, that's a $3 trillion economy growing at, you know, 5, 6, 7%. So that's a tremendous amount of just economic compression in the first order. But we're not looking at uh, questions of well-being, uh, questions of livelihood security, et cetera, which tie us to the rest of the SDGs. So if we start looking at full second order costs in some senses, these are really large impacts. They may add up to you know, a large fraction of the value added that a country would be making. And India's relatively, uh, you know, more, let's say mobile and uh, significant uh, middle income country. If you take a much smaller country, you'd be in, in pretty dire straits. Uh, if you have multiple, uh, let's say cyclone impacts and you have heat stress that's hitting you after that. So uh, this is a serious business, even on the economic side. Thank you so much, Mr. Ravi. And, and Mr. Said, I don't know if you want to come in to answer that question as well. If not, I see we have another hand up. I just wanted to highlight that it's, uh, I mean, taking the, the question in, I mean, when we reflected to the case of Yemen, it's very much important to consider uh, doing different interventions at the different levels. Uh, here, I mean, the situation is very tense when uh, taking into consideration the division of the country into two parts. And the conflict itself, it, it's very important that we work at different levels, including the national government as a uh, govern, governorate as well as the local level. Uh, so as to be able to uh, achieve some uh, impact and also a change uh, to the um, excessive extraction of water resources uh, and also put an end or try to put an end to this, uh, uh, to this issue. Over. Thank you so much for your answer. And with that, I'd like to recognize Angelica Planets has her hand up and Angelica, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you um, very much. And thanks so much for all the panelists. I think this is a really a super interesting topic. And for me, and uh, the most striking issue is actually the need to strike a good balance between the various trade-offs. I think this came across in uh, Aroma's presentation, you know, progress in one area of the SDG will have costs in another. And I think also uh, in Tofik's presentation, uh, basically we do something for one stakeholder group, it might be at the expense of the other, and we need to strike those trade-offs. So the question um, that I have is, you know, these are actually political, very much political processes and negotiations. So how ready and how well equipped are we to actually um, manage and support this kind of processes? Thank you. Shall I jump in on that, Laura? So at least from the climate point of view, Angelica, I think what, what the AR6 cycle has done is given us a fairly good mapping of the solution space. And especially uh, exactly what you're saying, the synergies and trade-offs between multiple SDGs and also between adaptation and mitigation. It's not as if everything is hunky-dory and they'll all work together. So we do have a mapping of that space. It's been done systematically, uh, I would say, global scale for sure. 
and certainly in in three continents africa uh, latin america and 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 europe i think the challenge for us in the next few years is to you know be able to extend it to across the globe number one and to take it down to national and subnational level because frankly the implementation happens at the local level and the challenge there i would say is basically building the knowledge and the institutional capacity to actually do the stuff like we're talking about if you're on a coast versus being in a mountain area versus somewhere else the intervention set and you know the vulnerability sets are actually quite different so this is i think an interesting challenge for the intergovernmental system and of course uh, national um, uh, local and regional governments to try and build this about because they are trade offs absolutely so and they will become even worse as we start into the 1.5 overshoot uh, and the trade offs become even 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 more difficult to deal with so we might as well accept that they're going to be there and we have to have analytical methods and processes to make this happen and they will be winners and losers which means they have to be political fora where you can debate this question you know you have to share in some senses the losses more than the gains because the losses are going to increase exponentially especially hydrometeorological losses uh, and the gains may be much weaker especially for more vulnerable groups thank you so much mr ravi i'm not sure if any of the other panelists wanted to come in on that question Yes, please. While the implementation is at the local level, I mean, it's very much important as highlighted by Irma that it's important to engage the national as well as the regional level as well. Um, in, in the case of Yemen, um, and, uh, we are facing so many difficulties and challenge, challenges to engage them due to the conflict. And taking into consideration, we are dealing with two types of authorities and each one is claiming its legitimacy. Um, on our part, we're trying to be as conflict sensitive as possible and trying to engage them in a very technical um, manner. Um, at, the, at, at the local level, uh, I mean, the space and the freedom to implement is, is very much compared to the regional as well as the uh, national level. Over. Thank you so much, Mr. Said. Um, so I think in conclusion, I'll just pose a broad question to all of the panelists, but looking at the range of resilience deficits and, and acknowledging that we do need integrated solutions, what do you think is the most critical action necessary for unlocking further progress towards risk-informed implementation of the SDGs and risk action in general? Thanks. Perhaps I can just jump in quickly um, and building a little bit on the previous question. I think that really there's some work that we can do to better understand those opportunities. It is an incredibly challenging time, but at the same time, there are incredible opportunities. And you see this in, for example, the green transition right now for well-planned interventions to create co-benefits across people, planet and prosperity. And there are opportunities to create better and cleaner jobs, to you know, put systems in place where we use technology to improve participatory processes and where we really leverage uh, increasing efficiencies uh, to, you know, if you like, get more effective use of the scarce resources as we move forward. And so I think really looking at that interrelationship and, and those trade-offs, but also the opportunities is really, really key because if we keep just looking sectorally, we miss some of those opportunities for the, the positive benefits. At the same time, I think it's absolutely essential that we take a longer view, that you know, we really think for every development decision we're making, we think about it for now, and we think about it for that future generation, because that's a very, very good proxy for beginning to think about, first of all, how we deal with more large shocks now uh, that may become more frequent, but it also helps us think more effectively about are we really heading in a sustainable di direction or are we grabbing a gain now that is simply going to be eroded by more intense and volatile events so just a couple of thoughts there but very much welcome other thoughts okay so just just quickly i think the most critical thing we have to understand is the challenge, the deep challenge lies with our current development paradigm and our implementation of development. So that we have to fix that first. Until we fix that, 
uh, through the SDGs and uh, by making sort of development more climate and disaster resilience, we're always going to be dealing with downstream, downstream impacts. And that involves very hard choices. And these choices have to be made now. We know that if we don't act now, and you know, unfortunately COVID didn't make, make much difference to what is happening in terms of emissions, we are going to have a setback to the SDGs, which has happened because of COVID. And we're going to have to deal with the impacts of significant warming simultaneously. So we have to act now and we have to act systemically. The good news is that we have a lot of options. The challenges, we're not ready uh, to finance them, to build the institutional capacities and deliver on them at the moment. And that's where I think citizens' engagement uh, and being very honest with ourselves that this policy crisis is not going to go away. It's going to become worse. Um, and we have we have the ways in some senses, technologically, institutionally, et cetera, to make this happen. But eventually all of society has to mobilize behind this. It can't be left up to one set of actors, whether it's the judiciary or the executive or citizens or the private sector to do this. This is, uh, this is a call uh, to you know, extensive transformative social action in some senses around the common good, because it's going to impact everybody both now and uh, you know, for the next many generations. Thank you so much, Mr. Avi. Mr. Saeed, would you like to come in on that point? Sure. Uh, to begin, uh, I mean, the context of Yemen into consideration and also countries with similar contexts, a bottom-up approach is very effective. Um, because, I mean, the, the, the division of state institutions in Yemen and the political prioritization make it, makes it very challenging uh, to reform and also to, uh, to engage as well. The working with the local structures, talking about the local communities, as well as local institutions, water user associations, is very effective in enhancing um, certain uh, practices and also uh, carrying out certain uh, changes, uh, for example, uh, related to the water resource management. Um, Why it's important to work at the, at the national and subnational level, um, the, the challenges are quite uh, big. And uh, however, it's, it's important to maintain that sort of relationship so as to support those local uh, level initiatives. Over. Thank you so much, Mr. Saeed. Um, Mr. Jackson, I see that you have your hand up. Would you like to unmute and take the floor? Thank, thank you. Thank you, Laurel. And thanks to all the panelists for the wonderful reflections. But as I as I listened um, keenly, um, particularly, you know, where, where Genetis spoke to reference to we and the need to, to, to measure what we value. You know, one of the things that crossed my mind is who is the we? <laughs> and, you know, because what, what we're seeing, and, and I think this links very much to Aramar's point, is that there is variability in terms of what we value. Um, you know, clearly um, there is a political economy around, around, you know, this issue, whether we come at it from a political economy of risk, the political economy associated with climate. And, you know, to Aramar's point, we need to motivate civil society and, and, and those at a local level um, to, to really shift this needle. My challenge is, how do we do that? Because even as we, even as we, we speak in this particular space, and we, you know, we, we're like-minded on some of the issues quite, quite clearly, and we understand the need for the pathway towards resilience. I think the message towards shifting the those who operate within this political economy is where I think we're struggling. And so, the question as we look at what's happening in Yemen, and we, you know, we examine perhaps some of those bright spots, is what can we take away? to really shift those who need to act. You know, the moment for acting on, on the issues around climate was, let's say 20 years ago, we're still calling on them now to act. Um, you know, what's gonna change that? And, I, and, I, and I'm sincerely flagging this because even as we speak now, we see governments who are giving approvals for the re removal of more forest cover for more housing. We see governments who are increasing density in water scarce areas and then they're turning up at cop right and and on the platform messaging around the importance of climate change 
So there's something there that you know that we, we we need to kind of reflect on a little bit more as we you know we seek as professionals to 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 sound the alarm. But now, how do we sound the alarm such that those who can move the the, the ballots towards action <laughs> are able to do so? It's probably difficult, but just a reflection as I listen to you and as I listen to to the case, and in particular Yemen, where water is playing a central role in you know in some of the the issues um, that that have been been addressed. So over to you. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. And you know, I really think that's kind of one of the central questions of our our time is how do we actually do all of this? And I don't know, over to our panelists, if any of you want to come in on this, I see Mr. Ravi, you're unmuted, so you have the floor. Thanks, Laura. Ron, that was a pretty sharp provocation, right? I would say in, in, in sort of order of precedence, you first need peace. I really wouldn't know where to start in the kind of challenges that you're having within Yemen in some senses. If you don't have peace, you really can't build on that. So, you know, and, and even large countries which are within quotes peaceful, you have areas in which conflict and, uh, you know, a whole range of state falling apart is kind of the norm more than anything else. So I think that's 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 a necessary condition for, for going anywhere. Of course, the challenge with, with both climate and disaster is because if, they, if they're not dealt with adequately and the full cycle is not broken, there is an endless chain there which leads to conflict. So that has to be broken in particular places. We know pretty much where they are and which parts of the world, and we know how the risk is going to build up. So that, I would say that's the first thing that we have to, to get to. But having said that, you know, if you take some of the most risk-prone environments of the world, and uh, you know, Bangladesh is a classic example over 50 years, where local processes, because effectively you know, these risks are popping up across the world uh, every week. So communities know about them. They've started to, to adapt to them critically. But there are lots of other structural processes that are coming in the way. Uh, and they have to get out of the way in some senses and let people to get on with what they want to do. But because, like you said, there's a political economy of, of land, there's a political economy of water, there's a political economy of who controls energy systems and what really uh, you know, is valorized in terms of development. Uh, like I said, the challenge for us is to really reimagine uh, what our development systems are about. Uh, and that's a hard, hard task at one end. But you know, people are fairly pragmatic. They want to get on with their lives, do do new things, especially young people. I think there's a lot of hope there, uh, as long as you know we're not taken off, taken over by artificial intelligence before we get very far with that. Another risk frontier. <laughs> um. Thank you so much for your answer, Mr. Ravi. And just noticing the time, I'm, I'm wondering if either of our other panelists would like to come in with a quick response. Otherwise, I'll just move to closing remarks. Uh, if I may, um, I just wanted to highlight that uh, we are working in a very uh, challenging environment. The challenges are, are, are too many. Uh, but again, as I mentioned, working at the local level is uh, you have some space to work rather than working at the national level. Um, the, in, in Yemen, even at the local level, when you work with communities, communities think, for example, water, groundwater is infinite. I mean, it can never end. And they keep extracting water and without any uh, regulations and rules. I think it's very much important to work with, lo with those local communities, uh, work with the local institutions to promote awareness first, to agree on specific mechanism that could be, uh, uh, I mean, adhered to by all the stakeholders uh, at the local level. If we are able to achieve that, taking into consideration the national context, I think we have done a great job and we could contribute to the sustainability of water resource management. Thank you. Over. Thank you so much, Mr. Said and, and Ms. Kirchwood. I don't know if you want to come in as well briefly. Yeah, no, I think just uh, partly to underscore that we do have a lot of experience and to really hold people accountable for what we do know how to do. These are not, uh, these are not radically new challenges. They're more extreme, they're more volatile, but there is a lot of capacity and across the SDGs, we have a lot of experience. So this idea that this is some new, natural, un, un, uh, unaddressable challenge is not correct. We need to be more systematic. We need to build 
accountability and we need to build uh, systematic approaches. And Thank you so much for providing those remarks. So I think that's a really great note to end on, kind of a note of hope that we do have solutions and we do have some work that we can build on. It's about putting the right building blocks in place. So I'd like to direct your attention in closing also to the chat where my colleague has posted relevant links with how to join the IPPN group on Spark Blue, receive updates and to see the recording and presentations and other information that was discussed today. With that, I'd like to thank you very much for your participation and thanks also to our esteemed panel and have a lovely rest of your day, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Have a nice day. Thank you.